2, and tonight we're going to finish off chapter 2, reading verses 13 through 20. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. When you find that, if you wouldn't mind standing with me to honor God and His Word. I see you made it back. Is my truck all right? There's only one dent in it. Is truck all right? doesn't care if I made it back. Y'all might have noticed I was distracted this morning. It's because my wife was taking my truck on a trip. I'm glad you made it home safely, honey. I'm talking to the truck. Let's begin reading verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, and ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, uh, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For ye are our glory and joy. Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. I thank you for the Apostle Paul, the ministry you gave him, the insight you gave him, and uh, for this inspiration to write this letter to the Thessalonians that we have, that we might draw inspiration from you through it. You are hope, our guide, and through your Holy Spirit. We have all things, and we pray that you would bless us now through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. As I've said in previous messages in this series, the common factor, the common denominator behind the effectiveness of the gospel in the city of Thessalonica was belief. Belief was the common factor. Paul believed what he preached, and those who heard him, they believed what was being preached. Belief was the common factor. Belief is necessary. Belief is the necessary ingredient to the effectiveness of the gospel. That is to say that if the gospel is going to be effective in your life, in my life, in this church, in this town, it must be believed. This truth is brought out clearly in verse 13 wherein Paul writes, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, or which ye heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively works in you that believe. Amen. Paul points to the Thessalonians, believing here, uh, the word that was preached to them was from God, not from men. And that highlights the fact that they indeed had a heart to believe. But he also states that what he preached was in truth the word of God. Okay, he said they received it as the word of God, and he preached it and knew that it was the word of God. That highlights the fact that he believed, he knew, he understood that the very things that he was preaching, the very letters that he was writing, this indeed was the inspired word of God. What Paul preached, what he wrote, it didn't originate from somewhere inside of himself. No, it originated, it emanated from God. Now, I have some understanding of what he's going through. I go back and listen to sermons that I have preached before. And when I listen and I hear the things that come from my mouth, and I think to myself, that didn't come from me. I'm not that smart. The Holy Spirit must have gotten a hold of me and delivered the message. That doesn't mean that I pronounce the word of God. It simply means that what I'm saying is in accord with the word of God. When Paul wrote, whenever he preached, whenever he spoke, it didn't originate from within him. It came, it originated, it emanated from God. That means that the epistles that Paul wrote, the letters that Paul wrote that make up most of our New Testament, that's not Paul's thoughts and ideas about God. That's not Paul's fanciful ideas about God. It is God's truth that God had revealed to the Apostle Paul. And, and that's just a fancy way of saying this. You know, what we have in the Bible, what we have right here, what I hope most of you have open in your laps before you, this is the Word of God. Amen. This is the Word of God. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is mature, thoroughly furnished, that is through the word of God, furnished unto all good works. And, and the word translated inspiration in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it is the Greek word theopneustos, which of course means God breathed. Theopneustos. Theos is God. Neustos is breath. Breath of God. The Bible is the very breath of God. And what that means is it has its origin from the very essence of God. Amen. Which means that this is not a book that was crafted and formed by men. This is a book that was inspired by God. And then the Apostle Paul here identifies his preaching, his teaching... He, what he wrote, what he preached, what he taught, he identifies it as the word of God in his letter to the Thessalonians. But Paul was not the only apostle that accepted his writings as scripture. The apostle Peter also identified the writings of Paul as God breathed. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. This is what Peter writes. An account that the longsuffering of our Lord is salvation, even, un, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking unto them those things, which are some things hard to be understood. Now listen to what he says. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also other scripture unto their own destruction. Right there. Right there, the Apostle Peter identifies that the things that Paul wrote to the church is Scripture. He compared it to what? Other Scripture. He said that, that uh, uh, unlearned and unstable men, they twist the Scriptures. They twist Paul's words as they do other Scripture. So what is the point? Simply this. What we have in the Bible is the Word of God. What we have in the Bible is inspired of God. It emanates from God. And as such, you can have firm, firm confidence in what it teaches. You can have firm confidence in the doctrines and the direction that God moves you uh, through the word of God in your life. In short, now listen, you can believe everything you read in the Bible. Amen. All right, now, some of these news networks we live with today are not reliable, not dependable. You can't believe everything they say, but uh, you can believe this. You can believe this. You can believe the Bible. And listen, this is the very first challenge you're going to face in your Christian life. Will you believe? Will you believe? Will you believe the word of God even when it challenges you in the way that you live? Will you believe the word of God? Will you believe it enough to put it to work and allow it to work effectively in your life? That's the challenge. Do you take God at his word? Are you dis do you dismiss the word of God and continue living your life based upon your presumptions, upon your personal whims and your opinions that you hope is, or will one day prove to be safe and true? That's not a smart way to live, by the way. Just to let you know, I mean, this may be my opinion, but I value it, that if you're going to base your life upon your own presumptions, your personal whims, your personal opinions, what you hope and believe will be right, and you hope someday that at the end of your life you're going to... These things will be proven safe and true. That is not a smart way to live. There are only two ways that you can live this life. You either live by the word of God or you live according to your own beliefs. But listen, if you live according to your own beliefs, you're living according to make-believe. <laughs> if you don't base your life on the truth of God's word, everything that you believe is make-believe. comes from in here. It comes from you. There is no, it is not foundational truth that you can depend upon. As a matter of fact, it is, it is sand. That's right. It's unstable foundation. And we can look at the culture that we live with that has cast off the word of God and see that living life according to the dictates of your own imagination, living life according to make-believe, it leads uh, to all sorts of sinful nonsense and complete stupidity. And we laugh when we think about how stupid things are really are. But if you live your life according to your own make-believe imagination, you know what that leads to? It leads to people who don't even know what bathroom to use. They don't know what gender they are. 
We've got a generation of children who are eating soap, soap and snorting contraceptives, for God's sake. And they're trying to tell us what's best for us. No, thank you. I'll keep my own opinion there. Not only that, it leads to cowards, people who are willing to give up their God-given rights. God-given rights. The government doesn't give us the rights. God gave us the rights. Amen. And it leads to cowards, and they want to give up their God-given rights thinking that that's going to lead to safety and security in their life. You know, there's a Greek word for that kind of person. Stupid! <laughs> We're living with a generation of wicked people who've decided that the word of God is irrelevant. And where does that lead? Where does that lead? Uh, listen, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 25 and 26, But ye have set at naught, that is, you've set aside, all my counsel, it would not of, and would not have of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 30 through 32. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple. Uh, modern day uh, translation of that word simple. For the turning away of the stupid. Even God calls them stupid. Shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But then you have Proverbs chapter 1 verse 33. Whoso listens unto me, whoso listens unto God will dwell in safety. They shall be quiet from fear of evil. Two ways you can live your life. You can believe the word of God, trust in God, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and know safety and security and peace and joy. Or you can trust in your own imagination. The challenge, the challenge of being faithful is, do you believe God or not? Listen, the, ch the challenge being clearly presented to us here in the book of Thessalonians is this. Do you believe the Bible or not? There are a lot of people in this world that hate this book. Uh, just recently, an article came out that said GQ had printed this article saying, don't waste your time reading the Bible. There's a better book than that to read. And it was some fiction story about a boy who helped his friends. There are people in this world, they hate this book because they hate the author of the book. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen. What's the saying? Some people say, I'm not trying to hear that right now. You're going to hear it someday. They don't want to know what it says. They, don't, they, they hate this book. They don't want to believe it. And they don't want you to believe it either. Because they have rejected Christ Jesus. And now they're nothing more than tools of the devil. And, and so they, they'll come up and they'll say, how could you believe that book? That Bible was written by men. You can't believe what it has to say. Why, well, that's an ancient book of fairy tales. I don't know how many times I've heard people say this. But listen, there's no man who would write a book like the Bible because this book doesn't glorify man. Not at all. No man would write that book. The focus is Christ Jesus. It glorifies Christ Jesus. It presents mankind in all his sinfulness and his need for a Savior. That's right. The Bible clearly presents there is nothing redeemable in mankind. Yet a man would write that. I don't think so. You look at the books that men read and it always glorifies man. And the point, you know, uh, at this point in the sermon, as I was preparing, I thought, you know, I, I could present all the outward attributes, all the outward evidence that clearly displays that the Bible is God-breathed, that it is the word of God, such as all of the fulfilled prophecy in the Bible. And, and of all the prophecy that has been fulfilled, that has been uh, prophesied in the Bible, that has been fulfilled, 100% literal fulfillment. That's if you take it literally or not. I keep saying that because of what that fellow said. He said, you know, the book of Revelation makes perfect sense if you take it literally, but who takes it literally? Well, I do. Right? I'm not going to dwell on that. You know why? Because if you want to know whether or not this is the word of God, read it. That'll tell you everything you need to know because this book will cut you open, Amen. lay you bare. Expose your sinfulness. Expose your need for the Savior and expose who Jesus Christ our Savior is. I don't need to tell you about all the fulfilled prophecy or the attributes of this book that, that, that show that it is clearly God-breathed, God-inspired. All you've got to do is read it to know. Read it. Besides which, if you're struggling with whether or not to believe, 
You know, whether or not you're going to believe the Bible, all the evidence for and against the Bible, that's not going to make any difference. Your struggle is not with the evidence. Your struggle is one of faith. If you're struggling with whether or not you're going to believe the Bible, with whether or not you're going to believe God and live by the word of God, if you're wavering between these two positions, if in your heart you're not sure if the Bible is the word of God or if it's not, if you're struggling with whether or not to take the Bible literally or spiritualize everything so that you can uh, justify living sinfully, listen, here's what it comes down to. There comes a point in your life you're going to have to make up your mind and then take your stand. You're going to have to make up your mind. You're going to have to make this decision and then stand on that decision that you make. Either you believe the Bible and you're going to put it to work in your life or let it work in your life or you don't. And every Christian, now let me tell you this, and, and I hope you'll understand, every believer comes to this point in their Christian walk of faith. Billy Graham struggled with this. If you read his biography, you'll see that he struggled with this. I struggled with this. I struggled with the Bible and whether or not I was going to believe it. You know why? Because it challenged me at every turn. It challenged my assumptions. It, it challenges me uh, to, to live to Christ's higher calling on my life. And, and that's not something that's easy to answer to. It's much easier to go with the flow. It's much easier to dis disregard the word of God and make up excuses for how you live your life and just go out there and be like everybody else. You'll get along with everybody better. I know that's for sure. But then the words of my dad always ring in my ear. Son, rivers and men are made crooked by following the pathway of least resistance. This book calls me to live to a higher calling. And that's not easy to do. In fact, I can't do it. I cannot. I've got to have the Holy Spirit working in me. I've got to have the Holy Spirit guiding my steps so that I can live by the book. And I'll tell you that there came a time in my Christian walk early on. I was struggling with doubt. I really was. I was reading the Bible. Something in it made me question, is this true? One of the things I struggled with is where Jesus called that Gentile lady a dog. Did he just call her a dog? Well, if you don't understand the context, then you could get offended, right? Well, I, I don't know exactly what it was this day, but I was struggling. Uh, but I prayed. What I didn't do was sit there and, and say, well, do I take it? Do I not take it? I said, you know what? The answer to this struggle is to pray. So I got down on my knees and I began to pray and I said, Lord, I'm struggling. And then the Holy Spirit, he pressed me in my spirit. This is what he said to me, not audibly, but in my soul, in my spirit. If you know what, I, if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit pressed me and he said, make up your mind. Are you going to live by it or not? Either you believe the word of God and you're going to live by it or you won't. So right then, right there, as I was praying and the Holy Spirit pressed me, I said, you know what? I choose to believe the Bible. I freely choose to believe the Bible. I choose to live according to the word, to believe what God has said, to receive all the promises, to heed all the warnings. I don't really care if anyone thinks this is insane or not. I don't really care what other people, how could you believe that book? I choose to. I don't care what you think. And here's why. Because since I've taken that stand, my stand on the word of God, the word of God has worked effectively in my life. Amen. I found it all to be true. I didn't start out, but, you know, I may have had doubts, but I just decided, you know what? I'm going to turn off CNN and I'm going to pick up the Bible. And for all the nonsense that CNN or Fox News or MSNBC puts out there, all those lies, little misinformation here, misdirects there, and people put that to work in their lives, and then they find themselves being played for fools. Yes, well, I turned all that off and turned on the Bible. This is the truth. Amen. You can't play me for a fool as long as I'm following this right here. That's right. That's right. It worked effectively in my life. Now, look at the last part of verse 13. Listen to what Paul writes to the Thessalonians. He says, you received it not as the word of men... But as it is, in truth, the word of God, which effectively works in you that believe. I like the English Standard Version. It renders the verse, you accepted it, the word of God, not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you, believers. Get this, the only way the word of God can go to work in your life is for you to receive it. 
The only way the Word of God can go to work in your life is for you to believe it. To hold it to be what it says it is, the Word of God. The only way the Bible's ever going to make a difference in your life is through belief. Because when you believe, it goes to work. It goes to work in your life. And let me tell you what the difference is going to be. Whenever, whenever you believe the Word of God, it's going to change you, and then it's going to challenge you. Okay? When you take the Bible as it is presented, and you apply it to your life, every area of your life, then what's going to happen is it'll work in you. The Holy Spirit will work through the Word of God. That will produce in you the fruit of righteousness, and you're going to begin living for Jesus. You're going to start living for Jesus as you never have before. If you just say, I'm going to believe this over everything else in the world, you're going to start living for Jesus like you really mean it, right? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what the greatest commandment says to do, right? And it's going to produce the fruit of righteousness. And listen, you'll go to church on Sunday morning. You'll go to church on Sunday morning and you will engage in worship. You'll go to church on Sunday morning. You'll be glad to be there. You'll go to church on Sunday morning and you just won't be playing the hypocrite anymore. You'll be doing something about all those hypocrites in the church. You know what the best way to get rid of the hypocrites in the church is? Stop being one. How do you stop being one? You believe the word. You honestly believe. When you believe, honestly believe, when you say to yourself, I don't care what other people think. I don't care if they think I'm crazy. I don't care if they, they think this book is, is, is unbelievable. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to take him at his word. Here's the word. I'm going to take God at his word. That becomes effective in your life, and that changes everything in your life. And it starts by changing you. Amen. It challenges you. It changes you. And then, as you start to live for Jesus, and you know how you know when you're living for Jesus? You begin to obey the word of God. You don't make excuses for not obeying. That's, right. That's how people pretend to live for Jesus. Everybody's got an excuse for why they ought to be, God's never going to challenge them in their sin. But if you believe the word of God, if you put it to work in your life, then you start obeying what it says. And when you start obeying the Lord Jesus, guess what happens? He opens the windows of heaven, starts pouring out blessings on your life. Now, that doesn't mean that life's going to get all, it's going to be sunshine and roses and get easy. No, you're still going to have challenges in life. What I'm telling you is that when God goes to work in your life, you are never going to turn back. God will start to change things, right? He'll start to change you. And your life is going to be God-blessed because God is going to be fully active in it. And then when God starts changing things, when he starts changing you, well, I'm just going to tell you straight up, I'm not going to lie to you, the devil's going to get busy. Because he doesn't want you living according to the book. He doesn't, listen, he, the devil would that all people were cast off from God. Misery loves company, right? The devil would that everyone turn their back on God, but even if you turn to God and believe in him, then the devil wants you to be miserable as you walk with God. And there's a reason that God allows us, and we'll get to that before the end of the sermon. But I just want you to understand this. If you get honest with God and, and, and start putting the, the Bible to work in your life, saying, you know what, I just choose to believe God, the devil's going to get busy. When you honestly start living for Jesus, the devil's going to try to hit you with everything that he's got. I like to tell new Christians because they always come to me and they say, I don't understand it, preacher. You know, I prayed and asked Jesus to save me, and, and, and I thought everything would be good, and now everything is just going bad. Everything's going the wrong way. And I said, well, when you're walking with the world, you're going in the same direction as the devil. He ain't bothering you. But the minute you turn around, guess who you meet face to face? And he's going the other way. Right? Verse 14, for ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Paul says, now listen, we know the word of God is effective in you, in your church, because your church, guess what? It looks like all the other churches we know of, which are true to Christ Jesus. And he doesn't mention about growth or Sunday school growth or baptisms. What does he talk about? Opposition. 
I like what Stott says. He says, all true churches which belong to God and live in Christ Jesus, despite any cultural differences, will display certain similarities to one another. And what that means is, you know, if you've got a, a church made of true believers in China and a church made of true believers in the United States, though they exist in different cultures, in different countries, they're going to be similar. If you were to go to church... In one or the other, that church in China or that church in the United States, if they're an honest-to-God church of Jesus Christ, if you were to go to church and worship with them, that worship would be very familiar to you because we are worshiping the one true God. All true churches of Jesus Christ will share similarities. Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, your church, and remember, now, Paul only taught there for about three weeks, maybe four weeks before he was ran out of town. Uh, so they didn't have any help from the apostles because they'd been chased out of town by the Jews. But Paul says, even with this, he says, your church began to resemble every other church which is truly in Christ Jesus. And why is that? Because they were truly in Christ Jesus. And then he says, he singles out the church in Judea for this one fact. That the Thessalonians were suffering persecution for their belief in God, just like the churches in Judea suffered persecution at the hands of the Jews for their belief in Jesus Christ. Okay? The last part of verse 14, and in verse 15, Paul writes and says, Ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary, that is, they, they, their, uh, their contentions with all men. Right? And this is Paul's way of saying this. You are suffering uh, for the cause of Christ from that same old gang of thugs that we've been suffering with all these years. That's what Paul is saying. These are the same men, the same women who crucified the Lord Jesus. These are the same men and women who've always persecuted the church, believers, the prophets. These are the same religious hypocrites who always stand contrary to everyone. And in case, you know, and, and I love how Paul does things. I mean, he just adds these things as a, like a, to end the sentence, but it is so theologically profound. In case you might think that these people who are contentious, who are contrary to us, uh, in case you might think that they have something to offer or that they might be right because they are very religious, you know. Oh, they wear their, you know, they wear their religion on their sleeve. They want you to know just how religious they are. Why, I have been a Pharisee for 20 years. And so Paul says, in case you might think that this opposition might have something worthwhile to say, Paul specifically says at the end of the sentence, they please not God. Pretty simple and profound, right? Amen. Say, Paul, what do you think about this group? I know that they've been standing contrary to us, but you know. I mean, um, without uh, Judaism, we wouldn't have Christianity, right? And, and so maybe they've got something. Or maybe we should listen to what they say. And Paul just says, they don't please God. Let them go. They don't please God. When you decide to live for Jesus, when you decide to live, live according to the word, that you're going to believe it, the devil is always going to oppose you. And he's still using those same old dupes that he's been using throughout all time. Religious fanatics who are caught up in nothing more than lies, and they think that they're doing God's work by persecuting you. The question that I, I think that most Christians probably have, who would like to, what they'd like to have answered is why? Why does God allow these people to mistreat us the way that they do? I mean, why does God allow us to stay here and suffer at the hands of unbelief? And we're saved, right? Sanctified, pure, have eternal life. Why doesn't he just remove the church from the world and be done with those other people? Well, I'll give you three reasons very shortly, very quickly. Reason number one as to why God allows us to suffer persecution at the hands of the wicked is that God is gracious, and he has very much patience with sinful mankind. What did Paul write to the Romans? What if God uh, endured with much patience uh, those that are appointed to suffer wrath? That's exactly what's going on in this day and age. We live in the age of grace. God is being patient. He has infinite patience, and he could be patient through all eternity, but... Let's hope not, because I'm ready for the millennial reign. Amen? Amen? God is gracious. He has much patience with sinful mankind. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. See, God's not willing that anyone should perish. Get that? He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. So he exercises great grace and great patience to ensure that all who will call on the name of the Lord had that opportunity to call upon the name of the Lord. So what that means is, look, if we wake up and we've not been raptured yet, which always amazes me every morning, right? If we wake up and we've not been raptured, there are still people who are being saved. There are still people who can give their lives to Christ and be saved. Unfortunately, God's grace and patience means that we have to suffer in the cause of Christ because there are people who are opposed to Christianity. And the Bible never minces its words about this. No Christian should be taken aback by persecution uh, because 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're suffering persecution for the cause of Christ, don't be perplexed. You should be like Peter and John who suffered a beating in the cause of Christ and went on their way rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer a beating for God. Lord, if you heard that, I don't really want to suffer a beating. <laughs> right? I have to be honest. Okay? Peter is even more bold, and he says that it's God's will that we suffer for Christ. 1 Peter 4, 12, and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. And listen to closely what Peter writes in verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer, listen to this, according to the will of God. Therefore, uh, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as a, unto a faithful creator. Amen. And why is it God's will that we suffer? So that he can extend his grace, so that he can show his patience and kindness to the lost, giving them every opportunity to repent. You're doing the work of the Lord in the world today. And part of that work is you've got to suffer from, from the hands of the wicked that God loves so much. That he was giving them time to repent. The second reason that God allows Christians to face adversity is because the wicked are in this age filling up the measure of their sin. Verse 16, Paul writes, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Listen to what he says, to fill up their sin always. To fill up their sin always. For the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. So what does that mean? It means... That because of the way that God is doing things right now, that when the judgment day comes, the, the day of the white throne judgment of Jesus Christ comes, no one is going to be able to say that God was not fair, that God was not just, because he's perfectly just. God never judges before the appropriate time. Paul wrote concerning the things the church was suffering in 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, and 5. And he said, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecution and tribulations that ye endure. Listen, which is the manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. He says that the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions that we are enduring, that makes evidence that the judgment of God is righteous. They're filling up the measure of those, of their sins. They are, they are doing nothing now but storing up wrath for the day of wrath. Revelation chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. And a third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard an angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged us. Now listen. They have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets... And now it's given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Or well, that's what they deserve. That's what they deserve. You see what that is, is perfect judgment of God. God's judgment is just. It is perfect. It is righteous. And God is allowing, in this age, for those who have rejected Christ to fill up the measure of their sin. So that his judgment is perfect. The third reason that God allows believers to suffer persecution, the third reason that he allows us to face adversity now and again, is because God's always going to test our resolve. God always tests our loyalty. Now listen. Father God in heaven above, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, our God is trustworthy. Absolutely trustworthy. But when it comes to us, well, we're not so much, are we? 
Hey, if we're going to be honest, right? We're not that trustworthy. Anybody can make a pretentious profession of faith. Which is why God's always going to test your profession of faith. When we claim to believe, God's going to put us to the test. My dad used to tell me all the time, Son, a faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. That's the idea. The idea here is, is this. Did you really mean it when you said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you lead? The idea here is this. Did you really mean it when you said, Lord, I love you. I'm yours friend. Did you really mean it when you said, not my will, O oh Lord, but thine? If you've ever, ever prayed anything like that, said anything like that, uh, made any sort of commitment to the Lord Jesus, he's going to test it. He's going to test you. I mean, some people play games with God, but God never plays games. Amen. And so the question that lingers in my mind, why? I mean, think about this. God knows everything. He's omniscient, right? That means all knowing. He knows everything. He knows us better than we know ourselves, right? He knows everything. Uh, he knows our breaking point. He knows, Okay. He knows how far that he could test us or push us or prod us until we give up and turn back. He knows this. So, so why is he putting us to the test? Why is he putting us to the Why do you suppose that he puts us to the test? And then even if we pass one test, what does he do? Does he leave it at that? No, he pushes the envelope and gives us another test. And you start praying, Lord, help me to pass this test. I want to get to this test. And you're thinking that after this test, you might get a reprieve when you pass that test. And here comes another one. You're like, Lord, when does this end? I'll tell you when it ends. When the church is taken out of the world. And there's a reason. He knows. Okay? God knows how far that he can push us. The reason he pushes us is so that we will know. That we'll know the strength of our own resolve. That we can grow in our own resolve. Remember here the Lord said, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. He wasn't talking about uh, you've got to endure to the end to be saved. He's talking about pushing you to achieve more and more and more. More trust, a deeper faith, a greater belief in God. So that you can endure through anything. All the way till the end of the age. Not to salvation, because you're already saved. He wants you to endure, endure to achieve that victory so you will know. You will know. When God challenged Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, that wasn't God trying to see if Abraham was that faithful. That was God trying to prove to Abraham that he was that faithful. You understand? And when God gives you a challenge and you face that challenge by faith and believe in God and he sees you through and you get on the other side, you are a more mature Christian able to handle endure greater things that God has in store so that he can do greater things through you Amen. in the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But more than that, you are storing up a reward. That's the reason God is always pushing us to achieve more. Besides which, the test to... Uh, without any tests, we would never grow in spiritual maturity. Right? I mean, Christian character is not produced when times are good. Christian character is not produced in times of ease and pleasure. Christian character is forged in the fires of adversity. And there's going to come a day, and trust me, God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. And there's going to come a day... When, the, when, when your Christ likeness comes shining through because of the things that God brought you through. That's right. Amen. When you're resolved to believe, when you're resolved to receive the word as it is, the word of God, and you're just going to believe it and, and put that to work in your life, let it become effective in your life, the consequences will be a changed life. And the consequences will be a challenged life. But there's even more than this. When you're resolved to believe and to live according to the word of God, your life produces hope. Your life produces joy. Your life encourages others. 
Paul writes in verse 19, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming? Your true faith, your belief, your hope produces, uh, excuse me, your, your belief produces hope. It produces joy. It, it results in rejoicing because it reveals this. Listen, and, and this is my joy and the crown of my rejoicing. Whenever you persevere in Christ, whenever you believe the word of God and put it to work in your life and we see the fruit of righteousness in your life, it tells me you believe. You are a child of God. You're my brother. You're my sister. We are one in Christ. We're heaven bound. <laughs> and that results in joy, and happiness, and celebration. That's my crown of rejoicing, to know that my children walk in the truth. What does John say? I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. That's my hope and my joy as the pastor, your pastor, to see you, this congregation, sincerely and eternally saved, walking in the truth, believing the word of God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul and the ministry and the word that you gave to him. The word that you inspired, that we had to inspire and encourage us. And I pray, challenge us in our belief so that we will believe a deeper belief, a deeper faith. Lord, help us to grow right here. First Baptist Church in Newkirk. And I pray that you could do mighty things through us because we believe. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.